do NAR leaders encourage people to take communion in an unworthy manner? Are people pronouncing judgment on themselves for taking communion incorrectly? Are we meant to take communion by ourselves? Is there healing quality in communion? Are we tolerating churches taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner? And what is the Great Communion Revival? All this and more on this episode of Churchpreneurs. Let's get into this. Entrepreneurs Podcast. My name is Richard Moore. In this podcast, I talk about everything that's moving me in relation to church and theology, hopefully to empower you in your ministry, church, theological understanding, and most importantly, your personal growth in Christ. Before we go any further, if you would do me a huge favor and click the like button, the subscribe button, and smash that bell, it helps YouTube get this content out to more people. Thanks so much. So on today's program, we're going to have a look at this idea that's been floating around the NAR for quite some years now. You may have heard of it, sort of the communion revival, or there's this book out called The Power of Communion. Have you ever heard about pleading the blood or applying the blood to yourself or others through communion? We're going to kind of tackle all that today on this episode. So as we get going, I want to whirl up my desktop machine here. We're going to have a look at two books. The two books I want to highlight that have this idea in it, the communion revival, or they talk about communion. First of all, the one is the power of communion written by Benny Johnson. Uh, with Bill Johnson, I guess he's contributed. Of course, Benny Johnson, the wife of Bill Johnson, who passed away from cancer. This is written by them corporately. They have a few sections in the book where they speak together. And then the other book where this idea is in it is from Joseph Prince, Eat Your Way to Life and Health. The subtitle is Unlock the Power of Holy Communion. And so we're going to highlight those books today. The other day, I just looked through this idea, the communion revival, and just kind of did a sweeping glance. And I'm like, whoa, this needs to be addressed. And so we're going to try to get at it today. First of all, let's have a look at this book by Benny Johnson, written with Bill Johnson. It says with Bill Johnson. I don't know how much he's written of it or not. The Power of Communion. The subtitle is Accessing Miracles Through the Body and Blood of Jesus. Yeah, um, I didn't know we could access miracles through communion. But anyways, I digress. Here we go. We're going to get a lot of my material for today from this review from Famine in the Land. They put out great content. Way to go, Famine in the Land. We thank you so much for your ministry. Rick Becker wrote this review of the book, The Power of Communion spot on on almost everything he said he's written the critique is kind of let's let me just go to the conclusion the conclusion is great here we go it's abundantly clear that benny is teaching false doctrines doctrines that will steal kill and destroy this book is not of him meaning of god so i'll take a lot of my ideas from this review here of of the book great ideas i want to cover just a few things that she says in the book First of all, there is physical healing in the Lord's Supper, or sorry, I, I use Lord's Supper. That's sort of my, my tradition, and I'll explain a little bit of my tradition and the four views of the Lord's Supper and communion throughout the show. So stick around, please, because this is going to be very thorough, and I might do it in two episodes. I think I might just have to because it's just so much. So we've got, first of all, she says, or almost in the very first pages. I read it. I, I, I got to, I got about halfway and then I had to put it down because it was, I just didn't have time anymore and it was too much crazy for me. And so it is really crazy. Let me just see if I can put it as nicely as I can. It is the absolute worst book I've ever read on communion and what it is. It's literally false teaching almost on every page from the start, from the jump. She basically says there's healing quality in the Lord's Supper, physical healing quality, and that you can apply the blood to your own account and to others' account by taking the Lord's Supper. 
That is not true. You cannot apply the blood of Christ to your account or to anyone's account. I, I've said this in a, several a previous shows. I think I said this on the show about Chris Vallotton. Please have a look at that. You cannot apply the blood of Christ to your account or anyone else's account. The blood of Christ is applied to someone's account by personal faith in Christ. I can't apply the blood of Christ to anyone else's account. They can't apply the blood of Christ to my account. I can't plead the blood for you. I can pray that you become a Christian and that I can pray that, that God would open the eyes of your heart, that you would repent and turn to him by to, to him in faith. And then the blood of Christ is applied to you by faith through the covenant of grace that God has made with us through Christ. You can't apply the blood of Christ to yourself, to anyone else. So at the jump, she basically says, there's a story that she gives that she was uh, had a friend who had a prodigal child and she took communion and pleaded the blood over the prodigal child. Can't do that. I mean, you can do that. You can, tr you can try it. It will be totally ineffective. It is not how the blood of Christ is applied to people's account. As I go through, I'm going to probably repeat myself on that because it is so egregious that you could think that you could plead the blood or declare the blood, or apply the blood of Christ to anyone else's account. You cannot do that. God does that by faith in Christ. So that's on pages 12 to 13. She talks about these friends who had prodigal sons or daughters, I don't remember, um, and she pleads the blood over their prodigal children. Uh, Benny writes then on, let's see, on page 14, communion partakers declare heaven over their lives. I don't exactly know what declare heaven means, but it, presumably it means that miracles and things will happen over you or through you or in you because heaven will become more real on earth. That's the whole movement, heaven on earth, on earth as it is in heaven, where they, where Bethel and the like, they take the war, the term on earth as it is in heaven out of its context, out of the Lord's prayer and apply it and say, that's the great commission. They've actually recommissioned the great commission. That is the great commission on earth. No more Matthew 28, 18 through 20, where Christ gives us his great commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That is no longer the great commission in their eyes, it is ripped out of its context, not your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, but rather on earth as it is in heaven. Just that that's supposed to happen. Whatever happens in heaven should happen on earth. And that's why they plead the blood over people and you declare heaven over your lives. I don't think you can do that. And you can, I mean, you can try, you know, you can try, try to declare heaven over your life, but it will do no good because it's not God's plan. It's not his will. His will be done. That's, that's, if you want to pray that, Lord, your will be done. Your perfect will is done in heaven, and we would pray that your perfect will be done on earth as well. Not that the same things that happen in heaven happen on earth. And even that, are there miracles done in heaven? That's my question. Actually, they what they mean is, I'm getting off track here, sorry, but you're, I think this is good. What they mean is that miracles ought to happen. Are there miracles happening in heaven? There are no miracles happening in heaven. It's perfection. There's no such, there's not a necessity for miracles in heaven. Heaven is pure perfection, sinlessness, where the moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. God is on the throne. He rules and reigns and perfect. His perfect will is done there. His perfect, your, your will be done is the prayer on earth as it is in heaven. Therefore, there are no miracles in heaven. So why would we need heaven to reign here? That There's no miracles done or, or you know, that that's, that's their proof that, oh, look, miracles are happening everywhere because heaven is reigning here on earth. Heaven, the, the space between heaven and earth, that's what, and she actually talks about that in this book, is thinner and thus more miracles happen. And of course, Bethel is a thin place. Uh, Kansas City is a thin place where the place between heaven and earth is thinner and thus miracles take place more often. But miracles do not take place in heaven. Oh boy, that just occurred to me. That's a freebie. Miracles don't take place in heaven. So how is that a measure of whether heaven is coming to earth? Just a freebie right there. Miracles don't take place in heaven. It's a place of pure perfection. There is no necessity for miracles in heaven. It's where Christ reigns and his perfect will is done. And so it's not necessary. Miracles are necessary here because things are out of order. The laws of nature uh, ha have to be set to the side for something extra special to happen. That doesn't happen in heaven anymore. So just as a side note, boy, that's a big side note. Sorry for that. There's no miracles in heaven. They're not necessary. 
there it's a place of pure perfection the moth, moth and rust will not destroy uh that that's heaven so it's not necessary then she writes on pages 17 to 18 i want to read this whole quote this is very interesting when i take communion i take it as a prophetic act that's first of all wrong there's no there's no place in scripture that talks about communion as a prophetic act we'll get to it but uh, at the very least it's a memorial now you may not have the memorial view but it's the least so there's several views above the memorial view, but at least it's a memorial. I would say the other views have a sense of memorial nature to them. Let's say the Zwinglian view, the uh, Ulrich Zwingli, who was a reformer, held the view, the memorial view, that Jesus is not present in the na in, in the elements, but that he's just he it's just remembrance of him. Do this in remembrance of me, and that that's just the memorial view. And the other views have a uh, let's say a deeper or a higher presence of Christ as you get all the way to transubstantiation, which is the Catholic view. They're all memorials in some sense or another. There's nothing, there's no prophetic quality to it. It's not a prophetic act at all. So applying it to a situation, what is weighing on my heart. So she applies the communion to a situation that's weighing on your heart. There's no, that's not the nature of communion either. A prophetic act is a Holy Spirit inspired physical action that disrupts the atmosphere. So communion also disrupts the atmosphere. It does not disrupt the atmospheres. No. Sometimes I'll feel as though God wants me to do something tangible to activate something that I'm praying into. During these moments, I simply ask the Holy Spirit, what should I do about this? Then I'll feel prompted, for example, to take my shofar into the prayer house that we have at Bethel or go onto a specific place to take communion. In completing the prophetic act, we are releasing something into the atmosphere that helps the answer to your prayer to break through. So no, 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 no. So <laughs> this is all false. 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 And false. There's no, it's, you can do all that stuff but it's not doing anything. It's not breaking anything into the atmosphere. You, and so she says, basically, you can take communion, go if you if you think you're gonna you know, have this prophetic impulse or whatever, I don't know, a prophetic thought, then you gotta go get your shofar, blow it into the atmosphere and take communion and it'll release something into the atmosphere. No, it will not. That's a construct of her own imagination. These are imaginings that do not stand anywhere in scripture. There's no precedent for any of these actions that you can take stuff into the atmosphere. There's the quote up there. What should I do about this when I feel prompted, for example, take my shofar into the prayer house and then break things out in the atmosphere? That does not happen. That's paganism, animism, more than it is Christ the Christian faith. I don't see any precedent for you taking communion and you breaking things out in the atmosphere and releasing things. It just That's just a construct. She's created that thing. That description is a construct that is in her own imaginations. She also says, you can apply the blood of Jesus over her own life and send every curse meant for harm back to where it came from. She tells a story about someone who was cursed and this person had something on her life, you know, it was witchcraft or something like this. And then she said she took communion and she was to apply the blood of Jesus over her own life and send every curse meant to harm her back to where it came from. Meaning the communion, act of communion, take communion, applied the blood of Jesus to her life and it sent the curse back to where it came from. Meaning return the curse to the cursor, uh, not the cursor on your computer, but the cursor who cursed you. Wow. <laughs> Voodoo, witchcraft, animism, all rolled up into one. Folk religions, I mean, this is not the Christian faith. This is not the practice of Christianity. You can't send a curse back by taking communion. This is what she said. You send the curse back to the person who cursed you. Uh, mm -mm, no. No, 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 no. So, the, moving on, healing in communion. Uh, she talks about infertility. People had took communion more frequently. So not just by yourself taking communion, but daily taking communion by yourself as a couple. So there was a, a couple that she told the story of having problems with fertility. They started taking communion daily and maybe even more frequently than daily together. And the more frequently they took it, the more the fertility problems went away and they got pregnant. She tells that story. Falling out, people falling out in the spirit while taking communion, meaning laughing hysterically on the floor or falling out on the floor and being out of control, being not in, not in control of their faculties anymore. That's not 
a thing either. There's no evidence of anybody in the New Testament taking communion, taking the Lord's Supper, and losing control of their senses, of their faculties. That doesn't happen. I mean, it can happen to people, but that's not the Holy Spirit's work. The Holy Spirit's work is not you falling out while taking communion, meaning losing control of your faculties. That's not a Holy Spirit work. But anyways, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. If you fall out in the Spirit, you're not falling under the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit fruit is self-control. If you have lost control of your faculties and you say, I just can't control myself anymore, I'm laughing uncontrollably, I'm falling on the ground uncontrollably, that is not a fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has not done that to you. Now, it may be a construct, you may have built something, and you may be doing it by yourself, you may be, you may be just a feeling, you're, you're feeling something that is great, overwhelming sense of whatever, that's not a fruit of the Holy Spirit where you have lost control of your faculties and you cannot sit upright anymore. You can't stand up anymore. People talk about falling out. Think about a Benny Hinn conference where you flying off the ground, like Todd White saying, I flew off the ground. The chairs flew upside down and all that other stuff. That's not the work of the Holy Spirit, if it happened at all. <laughs> she encouraged in the book, throughout the book, taking communion privately, personally, and every day, uh, even multiple times a day. Communion is not meant to be taken privately. It is meant to be taken corporately and only in the body of Christ, the, the members with other members of the body. All right, so let me flip over here to my Logos and we'll get this passage of scripture, one of the most famous passages of scripture that talk about the Lord's Supper. And it's where Paul describes what he received from the Lord and he received this Apparently, when he spent time with the Lord in the wilderness, when he was two years in the wilderness, and so the Lord described to him what ought to take place in the Lord's Supper. And he is talking to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. And here's what Paul says about the Lord's Supper. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you. So he, this is his reprimand. He's reprimanding them about what they've been doing in the Lord's Supper. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. Verse 19, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, the other gets drunk. And, he, and then Paul's like, what? I love that. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. <laughs> He's getting after him, man. Paul's getting after him. Here we go. So he says in verse 23 and 24, for I received, and this is the, the one you've probably heard uh, when people take communion, this is typically the one that's read before you receive it. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So just real quick, I said it's a remembrance. So the Lord's Supper is certainly two things. If it is the other things, then that's okay, and we can talk about those things, but it certainly is two things. The first thing is, it is a remembrance. Jesus said it of himself. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I remember growing up, we had a uh, the table, the, Lord, the Lord's table. There was a, uh, this quote was underneath engraved in it. It says, do this in remembrance of me. So we celebrate for sure. The first thing we celebrate it for is remembrance. The second thing Paul says, for in doing this, if you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's a proclamation. So it actually has a gospel element in it. You are proclaiming the Lord's death. You are proclaiming his death, burial, and resurrection. It's a remembrance and a proclamation. All right, let's go on. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Whoa, okay. So we're seeing, wow, whoever drinks the uh, cup and eats the bread in an unworthy manner is guilty of cons sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. And then it goes on. So we ought to be not taking it in an unworthy manner. 
And so he's explaining the ways we ought to take it together. Uh, it's, it's, it's not to be taken by yourself. And he actually t- talks about this. So he says, let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why. So what, when we say, we think, well, what is discerning the body? Discerning the body of Christ, discerning people who are in the church, meaning don't take it by yourself. <laughs> and he talks about that. He actually says, some of you are going ahead with others and, and there aren't even people there yet. You know, you've, you're drunk by the time the, the, the Lord's Supper starts. What are you doing? So he says that it should not be taken alone. It's not taken in isolation. It's taken with the body, the body of Christ, everybody with each other. So here's what he says. That is why many of you are weak and ill and have some have died. What? What? So... This would go right here directly against Bethel's teaching and her teaching, Benny Johnson's teaching in this book. First of all, that healing is in the atonement, that God wants you to be healed only always ever. And it would kind of contradict their theology that God could give sickness. Here's what happened. And he's actually saying this has happened to you. First Corinthians 1130 says that is why you're, if you're doing this, taking the Lord's supper in an unworthy manner, that is why some of you are weak ill and have fallen asleep or some have died. So some, some translations say some have, have fallen asleep, meaning have died. So God had used the Lord's Supper or taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. He used sickness, illness, and weakness and death to discipline the church in Corinth for taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Bethel's theology says God could never give away sickness, never give away illness. Sickness and illness only come from Satan. That's not true. This passage right here, 1 Corinthians 11.30, shows that that is not accurate. God judged or disciplined the church body at Corinth by giving them illness, weakness, and death. I should actually look into this and see who had died, if there's any record of of what was what had happened. But this is an indication that people had actually suffered under the discipline of God. For some have died. That's more than one or two. I mean... Some have died as two or more at least. And many of you, many of you are weak and ill. They're ill because they had taken the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. God was disciplining them. Wow. So then verse 31, he says, But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined. Talking about this discipline that had had been circulating. God was disciplining them so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So that's interesting. God was disciplining them so that the condemnation of the that the world will receive would not be fall on our shoulders. So he was gracious to discipline them, to show them that they are taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. That's a gracious work of God. Isn't that something? That's really incredible. So then my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment about the other things I will give directions when I come. Several things here. You can't take the Lord's Supper by yourself. That is not a Christian practice. They've created stuff. She says clearly throughout the book, her and her husband had taken the Lord's Supper daily, and as she got sicker when she was having cancer, she took the Lord's Supper more frequently and even more than once a day. You can't do that. That is not a Christian practice. Right here, very clearly, Paul describes, wait for each other. If you don't discern the body of of Christ, you're eating and drinking judgment on yourself. Their practice of taking the Lord's Supper by themselves in their homes and teaching other people who are infertile or not well to take the the Lord's Supper more frequently, that's a false teaching. You should not take the Lord's Supper by yourself. If you get anything from me today in these shows, I'm going to do two now, I think. You cannot take the Lord's Supper by yourself. That is not a Christian practice. You must take the Lord's Supper together in a body of believers who is gathered together for the sacraments. You can't take it by yourself. You can't take it by yourself. You can't take it multiple times a day. You can't take it to heal yourself. You can't take it to apply the blood of Christ to you. Christ does the application of his blood by himself through faith. You can't apply it to anybody else's account. You can't proclaim or decree or bring heaven to earth through the, through the communion. None of that is real. The parts I've read of this book, and I've read about half, like I said, 
are all false. 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 The entire premise of the whole book is false. The communion, the Lord's Supper, is not in any way like she describes it. All of it. So then uh, Benny goes on to describe on page 41, I want to read this quote, the blood of Jesus paid for everything. It washed us white as snow so we could enter the presence of the Lord without an intermediary and without fear. The blood of Jesus gave us freedom from uh, freedom and authority. Hell has been defeated for all eternity, and now we get to boldly release heaven to earth. Two things are quite wrong with this. First of all, without an intermediary. Now, I don't know what she means by that. If she's, if she's saying without an extra intermediary, but we have one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. First Timothy 2 verse 5 says, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So there is an intermediary. Now, I don't know if she means without an extra intermediary apart from Christ, if that's the case is what she means, then I agree. Uh, but it doesn't really make it clear here. It seems like you come into the presence of the Lord and there's no intermediary. She's actually saying, so let's read it again. The blood of Jesus paid for everything. Let me get to that page, actually. On my e-version, it's page 16. On the uh, real version, the paper version, I think it's page 41. She says, nothing will be the same. The blood of Jesus paid everything. It washed us white as snow so we could enter the presence of the Lord without an intermediary and without fear. So if she means by no extra intermediary outside of Jesus Christ, I agree. There is one mediator, only one. There's no priest. There's no prophet. There's no king anymore. He is the perfect prophet, priest, and king. Jesus Christ himself is the perfect intermediary. And that's it. There's no other intermediary. If that that's what she means, and I'm in agreement. But it doesn't seem like that's what she means because she says, come in the presence of Jesus without an intermediary and without fear. I mean, that's the problem on these guys and, and the people in the NAR, and I'm sorry, girls, these women <laughs> who write books in the NAR, their language is not precise. Now, I'm sure I have been guilty of not being precise, but it seems like all you'd have to do is just say, without an extra intermediary outside of Christ. But the language isn't precise. They don't think in those terms. And then they say, release heaven on earth. The Lord's Supper and communion does not release heaven on earth. Doesn't do it. It's not what it is. There's no indication of that anywhere. And this is actually funny. Let me highlight this, what Rick Becker uh, says in this review. He says, this is a steak and arsenic sentence. It's, you know, it's really good. And then all of a sudden poison, food and poison, truth and error. How do believers release heaven on earth? Where is this concept taught in scripture? It is just not taught in scripture anywhere. You can't release heaven on earth. That's not what we ought to be about. We ought to be about the gospel and proclaiming the gospel and the, the, the great commission, not the new commission, releasing heaven on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. So that is very a very sideways quote. And probably she's talking about no extra intermediary, but I don't know. It's not real clear. Then she has a story of a guy named Henry Groover. Groover, I think, Groover, G-R-U-V-E-R. Don't know who this is. He's a very powerful intercessor who made a trip to Wales in order to pray and release the kingdom. He was walking around some river and heard the screams, some young women screaming. He tried to go and hear where they were screaming, and he got to the place where he heard the screams, and there was nobody there. He was seeing a vision of Roman slaves, apparently, from the times of Rome. And then he... This is really crazy. It gets so crazy. You can't even believe the crazy. So the he heard these screams and there was, he's out a vision then of these slaves who are being enslaved, young girls who are being enslaved and all the horrible atrocities that happened to them during the Roman times. And then the Lord said to him, this happened back in the third century, whatever he was having a vision of, and their innocent blood is still crying from the ground. Groover asked God what he should do and go told him to remit those sins. People, people, let me, wow. What? I don't even know where to begin. You cannot remit sins. Groover can't remit sins. He can't even pray that those sins will be remitted. Wow. 
Wow. God told Groover that this act would take back the stronghold of the area, free the ground and the entire creation in that area. Groover obeyed and forgave the sins of the Romans. Apparently this guy Groover forgave the sins of the Romans back then and remitted their sins. I mean, so just as a heads up, that story was not in the book, but it is on this link. Rick Becker talks about that story in his review of this book and Benny Johnson gives this link here. This is the link here that I've highlighted about Henry Groover forgiving the sins, remitting the sins of the Romans who enslaved young girls back in the day in the third century. So he was remitting the sins of those people back in the day and then releasing the goodness of God over the land wherever he was in Wales, I believe it was. I mean, it's just, it's outrageous. And so Benny Johnson posts this, gives this link to this story and give and gives him huge props as a wonderful man of God and an intercessor that's above above and beyond. Here's the page. Henry Groover, a powerful intercessor, shares a story of when he made a trip to Wales and yeah, no, none of that happened. I mean, he can think he remitted sins, but he did not remit sins. Only God through Jesus Christ can remit your and my sins, much less sins of people who lived in the third century. You cannot remit their sins anymore, Groover. Sorry, Henry Groover, whoever you are, you are not God. You cannot remit anyone's sins, much less the sins of people who lived in the third century and then release freedom over the land or goodness over the land. You can't do that. You are not that powerful. God only can remit and forgive sins. All right, here is a, another quote that Benny Johnson says in on page 21 on the e-version, 56 on the paper version. When we take communion and declare total health over our bodies, we are aligning ourselves up with what the body of Christ did for us. If we believe that the Bible says that by his stripes we are healed, then there has to be something important in the act of partaking in this during communion. His body suffered so that our bodies wouldn't have to. When we take the bread, we are testifying that he is the healer, that he would that we don't have to walk in sickness, that what Jesus did on the cross changed everything. So this is really wild. So she talks about in this book that she took communion more frequently as she got sick, as, as well as Bill Johnson was sick and ill. He had some kind of uh, big time surgery or something like this. And I just wonder what happened. If this is actually true and that she can apply the healing power of the atonement to her account through taking communion, what happened? Why did she die? Why didn't the cancer go away? Why didn't the declaration of total health that she was doing, she was in, in, engaged in through communion work on her behalf. I want to be as sensitive as I can here, but the theology does not work. In practicality, it we die and we all die of something. She died of, happened to die of cancer. I'm going to die one day of something. Everybody dies of something. I talked to a doctor, 96%, 97% of people, he says, die of something, some illness, some degrading of their body, some decaying where the body stops to work, whether it's a, a true illness like cancer or some other disease, that's one thing. But 95 to 96% of people die of something and the rest die of their body stop working. They, you, you, your heart stops beating, you die decay and all that comes with it. We will never, ever, ever be fully healed on this side of eternity. Now, Christ did purchase for us in his death, a true and lasting resurrection from the dead, a healing that will, where the moth and rust will not destroy and thieves will not break in and steal. And we will be perfectly raised to life with a new incorruptible body. That will happen, but our bodies are corruptible now. And so this theology that you have access to healing from the atonement doesn't work in this life. It is not true. It's not accurate. God can, and he may, and he may by his grace and his will heal you in this life of something that, ha that happens. He is a good God and he will, and he can heal you of things but it's not a promise that is bound up in the atonement and I will die on that hill. And this healing theology 
hurts people. And you can't take communion and declare health over your body. It doesn't work. It didn't work for Benny Johnson. It didn't work for Bill. He he got ill and they were taking communion every day, apparently. It doesn't work for anyone. We all die of something. And how long do you have to do that then? So if if you take communion and declare health over your body and you get sick, you have to keep going and do it again and do it more. And that's the idea. They want you to do it more. They want you to do it more frequently. They want you to do it daily. They want you to do it more than daily. So how many times a day do you have to take it to proclaim the healing? So she says it right here on page six, going back some, since that time of taking communion daily in the hospital with Bill, I don't wait for communion Sunday at church or even for the Lord's nudging. I start taking communion as a tool in my intercessory toolbox. So she's an intercessor. And so she uses communion to intercede for other people. That's not what it is either. Communion is not intercession. It is not. It's remembrance and proclamation of the Lord's death until he comes. It's not intercessory. And she says, it's a purposeful and proactive part of the relationship with the Lord. I usually take it every day, sometimes multiple times a day. This is crazy. I usually take it and take it multiple times a day. And this new intentionality has shifted my expectation and understanding of the power behind the little wafer and the small cup of juice. What? What? So she was in the hospital. They were taking daily communion while he was in the hospital. She, it didn't work. I mean, she'd written this book and saying that this is how you ought to be doing it. She's saying, I did it with my, my husband in the hospital. He was in the hospital. We took it daily. And then I started taking it more time, more than daily. What does she say here? Sometimes multiple times a day. How many times a day do you need to take it? I want to say this with the most compassion I can muster. It did not work for Benny Johnson. She was taking communion multiple times a day. And in her teaching to apply the blood of Christ to her, to apply the healing quality, the physical healing quality of communion to her account and it didn't work she passed away i'm very saddened by this actually i am so sad please christian do not apply this hopeless pursuit to your account the blood of christ in communion is a remembrance and a proclamation of his death till he comes there is no extra power for you there's no extra healing for you to access there's no extra blood that you can apply to your account if you are a christian The blood of Christ is applied to your account by God once and for all. You don't have to keep applying it. You don't have to keep, like it wears off or something. The blood of Christ doesn't wear off. The blood of Christ doesn't diminish. His power doesn't go away. When you have trusted in Jesus Christ, I'm going to come out here and talk to y'all, man. The blood of Christ is applied to your account by faith and faith alone. It doesn't diminish. It doesn't wear off. You don't have to come back and say, oh, you know what? I got to refresh my blood. The blood of Christ applied to my account today. Oh, you know what? It's been a few hours since I took it. I got to replenish and apply the blood of Christ to my account again. You know, get my blood meter up through the roof or something like that. No. The blood of Christ is applied to your account. There is no healing power in the communion. There is no healing quality in the atoning work of Christ for this life. So communion doesn't have that extra nudge of whatever. And so you taking it more often doesn't have a better effect. You you can't apply the blood more pronounced than it already is. God does the work by faith. By faith, you have been saved. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. So you can't apply the blood of Christ more pronounced, more profuse, more, um, you don't, it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't wane. The application of the blood of Christ to your account doesn't diminish. And you have to kind of re-up, put your cards in again and and, and re-ante up every day or every other hour. She's done it multiple times a day. You're wasting your time. It's empty religion. It's vain repetition. That's it, man. Uh, Let's move on to, I want to have a look real quick then at the other book and just kind of read what this book is about. Joseph Prince, Eat Your Way to Life and Health. And the description right there is through engaging Bible-based teaching. Yeah, whatever. Joseph Prince is not a Bible-based teacher. He's one to be marked and avoided as well. Pastor Joseph Prince unpacks a revelation. In other words, he got a revelation from God of the communion that has never been more relevant than right now, along with showing you why the Holy Communion is God-ordained way to release life, health, and healing to us. Pastor Prince also tackles the tough questions. So is God punishing me with sickness and disease? He did. 
Funny enough, we just saw it. He did punish or discipline those people in the Corinthian church for taking the body and blood in an unworthy manner. Yes. So yes, people, God has done that before. <laughs> just to answer the question, and I'm sure he'll say no. Is it really God's will to heal me? God can and will heal, but he doesn't do it as a rule, and it's not part of the atoning work of Christ. Do I qualify for his healing power? What do I have to do when I don't see these results? Can God heal my loved ones? The enemy wants to do the blah, 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 blah. Bro, this is, this is garbage. There's no healing power in communion. There is no healing work in the atonement, atoning work of Christ. It's not a rule. It's not a law. He will give us new bodies incorruptible bodies on that day when he returns and we have our resurrection bodies. So now I found this uh, real helpful article on the four views of the Lord's Supper, four views of communion by Ligonier Ministries. So this is a good helpful article and I just want to kind of go over them really quickly. And the first view of the Lord's Supper or communion is the transubstantiation view, which is the Catholic view, which was, let's say, rejected by the majority of the reformers. I think all the reformers rejected the transubstantiation view of communion, where the elements, the elements themselves, the bread and the and the wine transform or transubstantiate the sub substance of the communion elements becomes the real and authentic body and blood of Christ. You are in essence then as a Catholic eating the body and the blood of Christ. The real physical substantial presence of Christ is in the elements or they become the elements. They become the physical body and blood of Christ. And that was a view that was rejected by the reformers. And then the other three were the other views of the reformers, the consubstantiation view, the spiritual presence view, and the memorial view. So the consubstantiation view is mostly known as the Lutheran view. I know a lot of Lutherans don't like that term necessarily because there's so there's um, the real presence is there in the elements, but they don't become, they're not trans substantiated. The, the elements don't become the physical body and blood of Christ. The consubstantiation view would hold more to a real presence, but not a physical presence. Not, they don't turn into the body and blood of Christ. Now, I'm not an expert on these, please. Don't don't hold my feet to the fire. I don't hold to that view. I would hold to either the spiritual presence, which is the Calvin, sort of the Calvin and his uh, branch view, and or the memorial view, which was the Zwinglian view. The Ulrich Zwingli was also a reformer. The spiritual presence view holds that Christ, his real spiritual presence is there in the elements and is there in the partaking of the Lord's Supper. And by that, there is a real means of grace that's applied or you, it is, it is a means by which people can receive grace. I would have a hard time with that because I believe that the grace that you need is given to you by Christ through faith and that you don't have to partake in other things that would be a means of grace for you. The means of grace is by Christ alone, through faith alone, from God alone. You can't do anything to receive grace. Now we can discuss those things. Those I don't. I'm not going to fight to the death on those things. But I, I I don't hold to that view for that reason. And the memorial view is what I would hold to. Now I could partake in a spiritual presence, sort of reformed or Presbyterian type partaking in the Lord's Supper, if they would have me and allow me to, I would be okay with that. But I would hold to a memorial view, which was what Swingley taught and held to. And that's where Swingley and Luther really uh, butted heads and they had their parting of company. They really, they, they, they did not, I think if I understand right, they did not speak to each other ever again. And this was the thing that broke the straw that broke the camel's back as it were. This was the argument that made them split company, which is okay. I don't, think this is a, a wrong thing or sinful necessarily. Unfortunate, maybe. I wish they could have maybe come to some kind of communion and understanding of what, you know, how to navigate this and how to be brothers and still have fellowship. But Singley really 
rejected all of the the other views and especially the transubstantiation. Now I understand in those times that was they were trying to really the the transubstantiation view was so bad that they really were trying to buck the system and probably Zwingli went all the way to the extreme and but I do hold to that view because I do believe do this in remembrance of me and every time you eat of this uh, bread or drink of this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes as it says there in the 1 Corinthians 11 passage. So that's my view. I don't see a real strong argument, strong enough argument that it actually becomes the, you know, or, or that, that the presence is there, you know, the Christ presence is there. I mean, he is everywhere where two or more are gathered there. He is in our presence. So that is a spiritual presence in some sense. But anyways, I don't need to hash out the fine details of communion. That's not my point today. I want to point out that those four views, none of them include the things that Benny Johnson, Bill Johnson, Lou Engel, who, who are going to cover, or Joseph Prince. None of those views include those elements. Communion has no healing effect. You can't apply the blood of Christ to your account through healing. You can't, n- none of this. You can't declare health over yourself. Benny Johnson even says there are visualizing things. You can, during communion, you can visualize your trip to heaven. You can receive peculiar anointings. You can release sounds from heaven. You can change atmospheres of how people think. You can visualize Jesus and loved ones who've passed on during communion. You can visualize all that, which is, by the way, forbidden in scripture. It's necromancy. It's forbidden. You can create the future all through communion. Sorry, those four views of communion that the uh, that, that we've held historically do not include those things. They are adding to communion things that the historical Christian faith has not held. None of those things are permissible for us to believe about communion. They do not exist. So today we covered lots of ground, the four views of communion. We covered Benny Johnson's book, The Power of Communion. We covered Joseph Prince's book as well, and the ideas within those books that there is all these things that are bound up in the in the communion act, and they just are not. They're not there. And so on the next episode, we're going to de- dig deep into the communion revival, which is basically the basis for these things. Next time, we're going to cover Lou Engel, Bill Johnson, and a few others. Dean Briggs has also appeared at the communion revival event, and we'll cover all those things that spun off, I believe, off of this book by Benny Johnson. And Benny Johnson actually gave Lou Engel, put hands on him and gave him the anointing so that he could carry on this communion revival legacy. So we'll cover all that next time. That'll do it for today. We're going to cover the rest of the material in a part two, all the communion revival stuff that's coming out, that's been out for several years now. Thanks for tuning into this episode of Churchpreneur's Podcast. If you liked it, give me a thumbs up, leave a comment, write a review, and pass it on to all your friends. It would really help us get this content out there to more people. You can find out more information at my website at richardpmore.net. I also blog at richardpmore.net blogspot.com. You're welcome to follow me on Twitter or X. My handle is at Richard P. Moore 23. You can also email us at churchpreneurs at gmail.com. That's C-H-U-R-C-H-E-P-R-E-N-E-U-R-S. I'd love to hear from you. If you have any ideas for a podcast or any comments or questions, please reach out on one of those platforms. God bless you. Until next time, take care.